Okay, so I grew up with stories of uh, Robert Parker Scott, and he was a kind of archetypal anti-hero. He was a stupid avoided man who led four men to a pointless death in the ice. And when I got a bit older, I wanted to find out why Scott made his mistakes. And what I realised is that the kind of paradigm that made Scott behave the way he did happened in an earlier age, and that was from the Victorian age. And so, the, you know, exploration in the Victorian age wasn't about trying to find 90 degrees north and 90 degrees south, it was about trying to find the Northwest Passage. The idea of the Northwest Passage was, theoretically, if you could go over the top of the North, of the North American continent, you could save yourself some months and months of travel time. And that would be a really good thing if you think about it in the 18th century, 19th century. And another reason that we had lots of naval men exploring in the Victorian age was because of the Napoleonic Wars. Because during the Napoleonic Wars, you had loads and loads and loads, and the navy was just massive. And then when the wars ended, there was nothing for them to do. And they were all kept in half wage, and so they were sent them exploring so they could get paid. And the hero of our story is this guy called Sir John Franklin. And in 1869, which is quite old, he was given an expedition to find the Northwest Passage. And he was given two boats called the Erebus and Terror. And these boats were like the super fancy NASA magic boats at the time. They had everything you could imagine. They had king food, which was really cool. And they had a library of over a thousand books. And they had special commission plates that were well fancy. And the idea was that they would sail in the summer over, you know, up into the ice. And the winter would come, and they'd get ice in. And then summer would come, and they'd get, you know, the ice would melt, and they could sail over. They had three years of provisions, and they thought they could do the Northwest Passage. But because it was expected to take at least two years, and they had three years of provisions, no one went looking for them for a very long time, even though they were lasting in 1845. So, what happened? And it wasn't until, in the kind of very late 1840s, that anyone went looking for them, and they started with an overland expedition, and they did some expeditions with lots of boats. In the summer of 1850, they had 11 British boats and three American boats looking for these guys, and they couldn't find any information. The first thing they found was they found three graves on King William's Islands. Three graves, a pile of cans, and some other junk, but nothing to indicate what actually happened to them. So it was a complete mystery, and of course, mysteries, everyone gets dead excited and wonders what happened. And it wasn't actually until 1858 that they found this note. And this makes me interesting, because the first part of this note, in 1847, says that everything's fine. And just a few months later, they've gone back to the same camp, and they've written on the end of the note that Franklin's dead, the boats are iced in, and they're all doing a cross-country trek to try and get out of the kind of predicament. predicament. And they also found loads of junk, just stuff scattered, but absolutely no written account to indicate what happened, and no survivors. And so, you know, they had all this kind of stuff that wasn't really telling them what happened to these explorers. And it wasn't until a really cool chap called, come on, give me a second, John Ray. <laughs> this guy, he was a bit like, you know, Kevin Costner. He was a cool, no, Kevin Costner, he loved the book, not just like Kevin Costner, obviously. And he like chatting to the Inuit people and found out what happened. And the Inuit told him stories that no one really liked. The Inuits told them stories about men basically dying as they walked across the ice trying to get to anywhere where they could find food. Told them stories about finding cook pots with bodies full of human flesh and boots with human flesh in them. And it freaked everyone out. And it particularly freaked out Dickens. Uh, if you know anything about Dickens, he was quite famously anti Semitic. He also didn't like the Inuits and he wrote some really great things that he said that the Inuits were eating all of the Franklin's men. So that was very good, and Franklin had a big statue erected about him, and they just kind of covered up the idea that Franklin's men had resources to handle this. And even though Franklin died and he few years into the expedition, they said that Franklin's men would continue in the spirit of Franklin as Franklin would have done himself. And they did paintings like this, which you can notice this painting is not that happy, but they ain't, you know, eating each other. So, <laughs> you know, covering that up. But interestingly, in the 1980s, there was a scientific expedition, and they uh, did autopsies on the bodies on King William's Island, which indicates the men all had lead poisoning from their super fancy uh, tinned foods. They all had lead poisoning, which you know anything about Romans, they keep quite stupid and unable to deal with stress. And um, they also found bones 
in the area that they thought Frank's men could wander around. They had cut marks on, it indicates that those were two quarters of the body, and they probably almost said the hand of the cannon. At the end of the day, the Scottish doctor guy, John Ray, was right. <laughs>